So I've been working in the innovation field for about 30 years. And in that time, I've accumulated quite a few nicknames, most of which I can repeat in polite company like this. The Economist actually also called me Mr. Creativity and a serial innovator, which um, uh, helped me a lot, actually, in terms of figuring out very brief brand positioning statements. But the nickname that I uh, appreciate the most actually came from quite an unusual uh, innovation engagement that occurred five or six years ago. When I was asked to come in and do innovation strategy for the US Navy around the redesign of the aircraft carrier program. Now, we think about innovation as being applied in a number of areas, but an aircraft carrier, you know, the largest physical technology artifact uh, ever devised by the mind of man. Um, what's the rationale for reinventing the aircraft carrier and all of the associated expense and so forth and so on. And so needless to say, I was a bit of a gadfly for that project. Um, and at the end of the first year, uh, the head of the program came up to me and he said, you know, we didn't quite get you when you first arrived. Uh, um, and you're certainly a bit countercultural uh, relative to the mainstream of our organization. Uh, but now we really appreciate what you're uh, doing for us, and we've decided to give you a call sign, which if you know this culture, getting a call sign is a big deal because you can't give one to yourself. It has to be given to you. Uh, and they said, we're going to uh, give you the nickname of uh, the uh, Innovation Sherpa. And so that really stuck with me because in a way, uh, I get the privilege of working with lots of different groups, whether it's the government of Chile or the U.S. State Department or... BASF or you folks today to try to take you on a bit of a journey to the innovation high ground. Uh, and because I've had the opportunity to see innovation in lots of different ways and to practice it, to actually do it, you know, I think redefining innovation is really important in terms of the perceptual part of the equation, but ultimately it's what you do with that reperception that is critical. And I'm all about execution, I'm all about getting it done, I'm all about the how of innovation. And I would not be so presumptuous as to come here with a book of, you know, the 11 principles of how to do it and suggest merely that you read it, because that really is not how innovation, in my experience, works, whether it's working with a startup in Silicon Valley or a mature, large multinational company or, or a national government. You know, there is no three ring binder that has all of the answers where you can just you know, copy out a well kind of ordered uh, set of best practices, check off the box and be done with it. The, the call to innovation is really the call to a journey of uh, self-discovery and uh, design and invention and iteration and uh, experimentation uh, with obviously uh, a payoff at the end of the road or a payoff at various intervals in the road, but uh, obviously also a journey that has to be undertaken. So that's what I invite you to, uh, to uh, participate in with me uh, this afternoon. And I've got a number of different um, modalities, shall we say, with which we're going to uh, appreciate uh, this journey together. So the first thing um, that I'd like to do is actually refer to a, a somewhat unusual um, uh, uh, discipline from the point of view of mainstream innovation studies uh, to make a fundamental point about innovation, which is that it's about building capabilities. It's not about uh, necessarily uh, exhortations and hand-waving. And to do this, I want to talk a little bit about music because, I mean, music was my first career goal. I, I started playing the piano when I was five years old. I took a few breaks here and there. But uh, now as a, um, uh, I was recently made a Yamaha concert artist, which is great because they, among other things, I get to make requests for their kind of just out of the laboratory, super secret uh, technology-based keyboards. And lo and behold, through the courtesy of uh, Jordan Kitts, which is the Yamaha dealer here in uh, Washington and Yamaha Corporation itself, you know, here we have this instrument, which I'll be talking about in just a second. But um, I want to ask, how many of you um, play music or sing or you know, know something about the actual making of music? Wow, okay, so three or four of you. So I have to explain to them what you, you know, which is that this is sheet music. <laughs> so this is um, the blueprint uh, by which people produce uh, a composition. And um, here you have these little uh, round things, which are the notes. So that tells you where to put your fingers on the keys. And if this were a more elaborate uh, composition by someone like... Uh, 
uh, Bach or Chopin or Mozart, there would be uh, expression markings. So piano is soft or forte is loud. And often they'll have these little asterisks where um, the piano player is supposed to you know, put their foot down on the pedal here and then take their foot off the pedal somewhere else. So you know, the composer, Bach or Mozart, was very creative. But the job of the musician, in the literal sense, is not to create any new notes. It's to play the notes the way the composer intended. Right? And this is the way um, it works in a lot of organizations. You know, someone in the command module composes the music, and then we're all in the orchestra kind of playing the notes the way they were written. Well, you know, playing music by uh, the sheet music has certain limitations. You know, if I uh, went to the store and uh, saw this um, song, All the Things You Are, which is an old standard, um, and all I could do was to play the music according to the sheet music, it would sound something like this. Now, some of you I know know this tune, because you know, sensitive to demographics, it's kind of an old standard. But um, let me just make this following point. You might say, oh, I like that. I, I don't think you would, because it was pretty dry. But let's say you wanted to hear it again. I'd say, of course, you know, I'm happy to oblige. I'm here to make you happy. So I could vary the phrasing. I can't do anything more than that. So my job is not to create anything new. The music becomes, in a sense, kind of a control mechanism for uh, uh, guiding me in terms of the production of the notes. Now, there's another way of making music, which is improvised music. And I, personally, these days, am very fascinated with jazz, because jazz, to me, is almost a perfect analog for the innovation process. You know, It's about creating new notes in the moment that have to sound good uh, um, so you have this notion of creation, you have this notion of uh, some value for somebody, you know, an audience member who, instead of uh, walking out in disgust, you know, will stay there because they like the way the music sounds. So let me just kind of show you a little bit about how that works. And to do that, I've kind of, uh, I've brought a, um, some robot musicians to kind of help me along here. short on time, I won't you know, kind of go into details, but the point is all of those notes were created spontaneously in the moment. I wasn't thinking about anything, I wasn't reading the sheet music, I wasn't uh, trying to uh, analyze the uh, rules of harmony to, to make that uh, happen. And in fact, the less you think, the less you theorize, the less you premeditate, the more uh, um, aesthetic the music sounds. Now. Let me make the point that I'm trying to make. OK, so it seems like I've got your attention here. So let's say I, I, I call on, uh, on Michael and I say, OK, we've got a great project. You know, it's not on the program, but you know, we're kind of improvising with the program anyway. So tonight, at 9 o'clock, you're going to give a jazz piano concert. And I'm going to do all the things that a great manager does. Right? I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to make you believe you can succeed. I'm going to show you in our culture and value statement where it's important that you, know, you kind of free yourself to do this. I'm going to talk about giving you the right mindset. I'm going to get you a great piano. I'm going to guarantee you a great audience. I'm going to give you a sheet that's going to have all of the places where you put your fingers on the keys to play interesting notes that are going to make us feel happy about your performance. Did I say I was also going to encourage you and 
be positive and make you believe you can succeed, empower you? What's my point here? My point is that unless Michael has been in secret practicing for 10 years, he won't be able to do it. Okay? So the point is the management stuff that I just described is not unimportant, but building the ability to create in the moment in a way that sounds good is building a capability. And the capability requires a focus on what you get very, very good at that you make an investment in over time. So as you listen to my remarks about innovation, and we'll have time for discussion as well, I want you to be thinking about what in your organization represents that kind of focal practice, you know, that 10,000 hours of practice uh, that yields the ability to create something new in the moment that's going to satisfy, you know, delight your customers and, and fulfill your business mission. Because simply waving your hands and doing the exhortation and believing you can do it gets you so far. You know, culture is fine, but ultimately you've got to get good at something, and that getting good at something requires practice. And to me, it's uh, the case that people talk about innovation like it's a noun, like we're going to have more innovation. Let's get 10 more units of innovation or something. It's not how it works. Innovation is a verb. It's action, and it's based on developing muscles and skills and capabilities. Okay, so that's what this little uh, demonstration is about with the keyboard. By the way, you guys are concerned about innovation and cost. So the, the head of Yamaha Digital Keyboards went into the engineering department and he said, um, there's this thing called a concert grand piano. You've probably seen them. I actually uh, have the pleasure of owning one. It's nine feet, 10 inches. It's, it's kind of like an aircraft carrier. Um, but he said, I want you to make a, a digital piano that costs one-fifth what a, a concert grand piano costs, that weighs one-fifth, um, and that is one-fifth the size. And that's what this is. This is an Avant Grand. So actually the keys have sensors in them to replicate the feeling of a grand piano with hammers that are three and a half feet long. Uh, and it's, but at the same time, it's all digital. So you're welcome to come up and take a look at it afterwards, because this is just like a pilot technology that's only now beginning to make its way into the marketplace. Okay, innovation is a capability, not a wish. Jazz musicians don't get up on stage and pray or rub chicken bones together or kind of encourage each other. They get up on stage, they count off, they start playing new notes that sound good. It's a job, it's a skill, okay? That's the unsentimental view of innovation that I'd like to impart to all of you. Now, to me, innovation is one of the most often used, yet most poorly understood words in the management lexicon. You know, how many hits on Google have there been for the word innovation in the last 12 months? Anybody want to guess? There's three billion searches a day. I mean, how many hits for innovation in the past 12 months? Anybody? No guesses? Or guesses that I can't hear. Um, so um, here's the answer, 2.65 billion. It's very much talked about. But you know, this is the good news and the bad news. It's talked about so much that in a sense the word threatens to uh, almost become meaningless. Right? When I meet somebody and they say, oh, you know, you're the innovation guy and you know, we have to talk and blah, blah, blah. The first thing that I always ask them is, what do you mean? <laughs> by innovation, right? And I would encourage you all to adopt that habit. You know, when your colleagues come and say, oh yes, you know, we're gonna do innovation or we have a corporate intention for innovation or blah, blah, blah. What do you mean? Because this is a very complex field, right? And what I'm gonna do in the remainder of my uh, formal remarks is try to answer three questions for you. First is, what is it? Because if you walk out of here with nothing else but a kind of a, maybe a more enriched view of what innovation is, then I will feel like this has been a successful interaction. But I'm gonna add two more, which are why is it important? Because I think innovation has to have a purpose. You know, it can't just be, it's not like spinach, you know, it's not like the more innovation you have, the better. You have to have uh, a, an investment in innovation that serves some kind of a, a purpose. And then finally, I wanna talk some about how, 